Kneel before Zor! You can't go! All the plants are gonna die! I'm gonna take a bath. Bad dates. I'll alert the media. Boys, keep off the moors. It's evil! Don't touch it! The name's Pliskin. No! Welcome to Vintage Video, where we're re-watching the 80s so you don't have to. We'll be reviewing every major film release of the 1980s in chronological order, overanalyzing what you've seen and spoiling what you haven't. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jesse Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today we're discussing Sphinx, released... <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> Are you still freaking out about the spider? <laughs> A little bit. <clears throat> I've just... I'll protect you, Richard. It's okay. <laughs> He's so it's not big. a black widow, it's just a big it's spider. It's a big. really freaking okay. big spider. And today we're discussing Sphinx, released February 11th, 1981. It was written by John Byram, based on the novel by Robin Cook, directed by Franklin J. Schaffner, and released by Warner Brothers. Kelly Rowland of Destiny's Child was born the day this was released. Oh. Happy birthday, Kelly Rowland. I'm not familiar with her music. You're not familiar with any music. I know, but... <laughs> I'm just saying. You've I, heard of Destiny's Child, though, yes? I've heard of that. She's uh, one of them. the voices on that. Okay. It, it's not a, it's not a, despite the band's name, there's more than one person? Yes. The, okay. It's <laughs> technically it's Destiny's kind of Children. Ring it's, Destiny's it's like children. the Lone Rangers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Robin Cook's novel, Coma, was made into a film in 1978, and its follow-up, Sphinx, originally titled Tombs, which makes more sense. Yes. Mm-hmm hadn't even been released when the film rights were bought by Orion Pictures for $1 million. For the film's expansive reproduction of King Tutankhamun's tomb, $1 million were spent replicating 900 artifacts. Wow. I, That's pretty cool. And you know what? I think it paid off. Yeah, I it, think so, it too. It looks like it. I did um, the... Uh, there was a piece put together a, a vr piece put together for the for king tut's tomb that, yeah that was going around um and so you got to sort of fly through the tomb and see the artifacts up close and you know it, and i actually felt like this was a good representation of what i saw in that piece that's cool 30 minutes worth of footage disappeared in transit to cairo which means this could have been two hours and 30 minutes long no oh, i think it's 30 minutes of dailies disappeared okay um, but at the time, there was already a strained relationship uh, with our countries at the time. And so they decided not to pursue like an expansive investigation into where this footage went. Jill Clayburgh turned down the role of Erica Barron and Rutger Hauer turned down the role of Hazan. I could see him in there. Yeah, I think he would have been a better choice. Uh, I don't think it would have worked out as romantically as interesting. Uh, well, you know, but you know, I keep, you know, I'm thinking of Roger Hauer later, and I'm, I'm more familiar with his later works. Yeah. So I, I, I think, because even, but even in Lady Hawk, he looks kind of like older. Yeah. We start in Thebes, Egypt, 1301 BC. A dog sits on top of a hill in the Valley of the Kings, and we hear a loud growl from the hills behind it. The first sound is almost Wookieish, but the next sound is very familiar to me. Okay. It actually sounds a lot like the sound effect they used for the breathing of the sargassum fish in our 1970 review of Don Barton's Zat. Mm. I'm pretty sure it's the same stock sound effect, but I'll play them both here. This is the Egyptian growl. And here is the sargassum fish breathing. So I'll leave that up to you. I don't think they sound anything alike. <laughs> oh my god, I can't believe how much they sound alike. I'm going to put both of those in. <laughs> Two workmen are startled by the noise. They rush into a hole they're digging and break through a wall into the burial chamber of the ancient Egyptian pharaoh Tutankhamun. One man in the burial chamber urges them to stop looting and leave. When he tries to drag them away from the gold, one of them smashes him in the face with a candlestick, and three gravediggers escape and leave the unconscious man behind. Upon escaping, the men are caught by guard dogs and dragged to Menefta, the royal architect, and we cut directly to High Noon, the three greedier gravediggers are staked to the ground in the hot sun, while the reluctant one is tied to four horses, one for each limb. Menefta is in charge of building a burial chamber for Pharaoh Seti I and asks how it can be so easily robbed. The prisoner says that any tomb can be robbed the second it isn't guarded. He says he only wanted one statue to afford embalming for his parents, but the others were blinded by greed. 
The prisoner is whipped repeatedly, and Menefta makes him repeat himself. The prisoner says a second time that his cohorts were blinded by the treasure, and Menefta takes this comment to heart. With his last words, the prisoner puts a curse on the men sentencing him to death and anyone else who enters the tomb. Menefta calls for the four horses to be rushed in opposite directions, tearing the man in half at the torso with a loud pop. This was really intense, yeah. and I did not yeah. expect it to be as visual as it was. I, yeah. thought, I thought at most they would just cut away and you just hear like a momentary scream. Or you would just see that the yeah. horse is separated. Yeah. Well, this is what is called drawn and quartered, right? Correct. Right. And, I, and I guess I've heard of it in other, you know, contexts and movies and stuff like that, but I don't think I've ever actually seen it represented on screen. Um, have you seen Braveheart? Uh, probably. I think they do some do of it Do they do there. that in there? They do a lot of stuff on that movie, though. The other men staked to the ground begin screaming terrified as the horses get back to their ones. Menefta tells an assistant that he has learned an important lesson from the stone cutter that they just snapped like a rubber band. He tells the assistant that the secret will last much longer than they will, and then we cut to the official ceiling of Tut's tomb. Then we cut thousands of years into the future to the tomb's eventual discovery in 1922. We see a hole poked in the wall, and an eye peers into the tomb, and then we flash forward another 60-ish years to the present, where the film will be taking place, in a museum exhibition where the artifacts from the tomb are on display. Despite both being educated Egyptologists, Erica Barron and Aida are telling each other the story of the chamber's original discovery based on the written testimony of the two men who first entered the cave. Lord Carnarvon, the financier, and Howard Carter, the actual discoverer of the tomb. Once inside the chamber, they discovered a common oil lamp on the floor, which earlier we saw was left behind by one of the thieves who were put to death. The testimonies of Carnarvon and Carter differ in exactly one detail. Carnarvon claims that there was a roll of papyrus by the door, but Carter makes no mention of it. The only other person present was Carter's foreman, Sarwat Rahman, who left no surviving testimony. Now, we get a, a performance flashback of this. Right. Um, although it is the only time that this will happen in the movie, and I think it, I thought it was really strange that I thought, we're, we're, we're going to come back to these people or have more about See this, more of this flashback, yeah. Yeah. especially since some of the people in the flashback are actors of note. And that get pretty highly credited on the on the IMDb list. Yeah. Uh, and, and so I was like, okay, so I, I, at first I wasn't really sure what the timelines of things were. So cause, Because we start off in, in BC uh, and then we cut to this hole being poked and an eye looking through. Which is when they found the tomb. Right. Which we'll, we'll, which we'll we discover that, yeah. later. Um, and then we're in the present, but then we're back in the past again. <laughs> yeah, so just like, for a minute. And then yeah, we go back to the, yeah. the present and we stay in the present for the rest. But in the initial discovery of the tomb, Ramon is ordered out by Carter, who intends to photograph and catalog everything before anyone else is allowed inside. Obviously, Carter assumed that Egyptians couldn't be trusted with their own artifacts which is ironic because upon his death, 18 artifacts from Tut's tomb were discovered among his possessions. They were taken Oops. illegally from the country. Artifacts which took many years to find their way back to Egypt. In this scene, Rahman is squatting right about where the papyrus was and dutifully exits the chamber. And I think the implication is that he stole the papyrus he here. Right. Yeah. Carnarvon's wife is also in the chamber with him, but for some reason they weren't aware of this in the future. So maybe she didn't count as a person in 1922. She doesn't think that the workers want to enter the chamber, let alone steal from it. I doubt they'll even want to. They think there's a curse on whomever comes in here. A curse? <laughs> My dear, you've been in the sun too long. Do you recall the last time that someone was called insane for being in the sun too long? It was an assistant coach who saw a kid throw a shot put hundreds uh, of yards. Jesus. No. I've already blocked that entire movie from my memory. What movie? I oh. don't know. I don't know. I'm Earthbound. not even going to know. Shh, I was going to name it. <laughs> also known as Mother? <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think Mother was Earthbound 3, right? Oh, okay. What? I don't know. Is that a subtitle of another movie or something? Uh, no, it's, it's a, a video a game. video game reference. Oh, I don't get it. That's what Ness is from. From Smash Brothers. Hmm. Less than four months later, Lord Carnarvon died mysteriously. Within months, 21 other people associated with the opening of the tomb died in inexplicable ways. In real life, Carnarvon was bitten by a mosquito and later cut the bite shaving which became infected and he died from blood poisoning. 
Sir Arthur Conan Doyle was quick to blame elementals infused in the tomb by King Tut's priests, and people went crazy for that story. Tutankhamun's curse, or the curse of the pharaohs as it became known, has been largely debunked, and of the 58 people present for the opening of the tomb and sarcophagus, only eight died in the next dozen years. In fact, Carnarvon's daughter Evelyn Beauchamp, who was among the first to enter the tomb, survived until a month into this film's production. In fact, she died the same day they filmed the scene opening the tomb. Okay, Coincidence? I, mean, I made that part up. <laughs> <Not. Aww. laughs> so, the, well, but hold on though. Backing up, these, these are based on real people, right? These characters. Yes, Howard Carter and Lord Carnarvon were mm-hmm. the people that were there at the time. Uh, but she did. She the the character that I mentioned, the the daughter of of Carnarvon, did survive up until a month into the production. But mm. I have no idea what they were shooting that day. <laughs> Which one found the Stargate? That was Carnarvon. <laughs> Actually, his wife found it. She fell through it. Aida freely admits that the curse is a lot of mumbo jumbo, but she will mention it in her presentation because it sells tickets. It's the same everywhere. The minute I mention in Boston to anyone that I'm an Egyptologist, all they want to talk about is pyramid power. Aida asks about living in America, and Erica tells her that she lived with a fellow Egyptologist who was granted tenure when she wasn't. He wanted her to move to Chicago with him, and they separated. The only man that interests me now is my friend Benefta. Well, he's an excellent choice of topic for your paper. We see Erica hop out of a taxi in a Cairo marketplace. It's been interesting to see all these Egyptian movies shooting on location in Egypt so far in the 80s, because I feel like we don't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. Well, and uh, I mean, this is getting ahead of ourselves, but it's the, the, the differences in this movie of 1981 present day Cairo versus Raiders of the Lost Ark, which is supposed to be depicting... 30s Cairo right and what they had to do for Raiders because they've also shot in Cairo right but to, to age it down you to mean? age it down to like re- they had to like di- like not digitally but they had to like remove all the antennas from the roof oh interesting oh. uh we'll get into that when we get into Raiders but yeah they had to do all this stuff to edit the film to make it look like early Cairo and huh. you're seeing it here in this it's like a bustling city yeah Erica is swarmed with children who won't leave until she dumps a pack of cigarettes over their heads and they disperse. That's she can... how I get our kids to leave me alone. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> fine. Here's your, here's your Marlboros. Get out. She continues stepping over a sleeping dog and into a shop run by a man named Abdu Hamdi, played by Sir John Gilgood. Hamdi is currently refusing service to a Mr. Marcolis, as played by John Rice Davies. I'm tired of playing games, old man. This is your last chance. I can't help you, Mr. Marcolis. Oh, if you will excuse me, I have a customer. We both just ran out of time. Marcolis shoves Erica on his way out and kicks the dog off the porch. Yeah, <laughs> it was like really aggressive exit. Um, but also, I was very excited because this is the first of many Indiana Jones references yeah. that will be yeah. in this movie. Oh, my God. <laughs> she introduces herself as Dr. Erica Barron an employee of Dr. Lowry, and Hamdi seems familiar. She apologizes if it's a bad time. There is no bad time for speaking to a beautiful woman. And a beautiful Egyptologist. (laughs) This surpasses in miracles the invention of steam. (laughs) He walks her out of the shop and upstairs to his office for tea. Hamdi explains that Mr. Marcolis is frustrated because Egypt has wised up and is cracking down on the sale of ancient artifacts. All he has to offer now are carved scarabs. He hands one to Erica and has her guess its dynastic origin. I would say middle to late Abdu Hamdi. (laughs) I see I am dealing with an expert. She asks how he ages them, and he says he feeds them to turkeys and then fishes them out of turkey shit. He makes her keep this one (laughs) to remember him by. (laughs) (laughs) I like her line. (laughs) Thank you. I'll think of you every Thanksgiving. (laughs) Hamdi asks what she's studying here, and she brings up Manefta, which seems to freak him out. She says that she's pinned down a ten-year period during the rule of Seti I, where Manefta's architectural work is never mentioned. Hamdi changes the subject to ask about the results of Dr. Lowry's wife's operation, and Erica claims he doesn't have a wife. She sees through his ruse, but it might have been funny if she was like, He said he wasn't married! I'm such an idiot! (laughs) No, no, it was a test, my dear! Hamdi apologizes for testing her, and he shows her the contents of a locked cabinet. It has a five-foot golden statue of Seti I. He tells her to check out the cartouche, and what he finds so puzzling is the mention of two pharaohs, Seti and Tutankhamun, 
along with a third name. Ernesto. One of the local kids tells him that men are waiting in his shop, and he peeks through a hole in the floor to see who they are. He appears terrified, but goes to see them regardless. Before he leaves, he entrusts Erica with a rare book from 1908. He asks her to deliver it to his son on her upcoming trip to Luxor. We see him fold up a paper into the book before handing it off. He closes and locks the cabinets and heads downstairs. Erica's curiosity gets the better of her, and she unlocks the cabinet to photograph the statue again when she hears the commotion downstairs. She looks through the hole in the floor just in time to see men swinging a sword down at Hamdi's throat. A kopesh. Sorry, Hamdi's kopesh. Is that Egyptian <laughs> for throat? I <laughs> know. That is Egyptian. It's a, that's a weird kind of curvy letter C sword. It's one of those, we've all got swords, swords. Uh, no, no, that's a, that's a different kind of sword. The, the kopesh, it kind of goes up straight and then is, it's almost like a question mark. Oh, okay. Like if you picture a question mark as a sword, but not as, anyway, yeah. Interesting. They start overturning everything in the store in search of something. They move upstairs and Erica freaks out and runs to a courtyard, leaving her bag with the book behind to avoid the men looking through the office. Unfortunately, her bright red hair stands out, but nobody seems to notice her. She watches them carry the statue out wrapped in blankets and then runs back inside to find her purse, but has to quickly duck behind some furniture when a man comes in to collect his bloody sword. Or what is it called? Kopesh. Kopesh. Another man enters and they fight for a moment until the unarmed man is thrown back through a partition and lands on Erica where she's hiding. She screams uncontrollably until the unarmed man gets a hand over her mouth. When he removes his hand, she screams again and he slaps her. <laughs> before introducing himself as journalist Yvonne Maggio. She wants to call the police, but he urges her not to, and she slaps him back. I don't like being slapped even when I am hysterical. She rushes through the marketplace, begging for help contacting the police, but nobody admits to speaking English. Yeah, and this is also something that immediately bothers me about her character, that she doesn't speak a single word right. of Arabic. Yeah. Now, I, I can see her not being fluent, but... If you're an Egyptologist, I'm sure you've had to study, like, written papers from people from Egypt. Right. And had to at least be aware of certain words. And she does some translating later, like, from text. Yeah. It's just like, really? You don't you don't know any words? Not even police, which I think would be a very important one. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's like, again, so even if I didn't speak, if I was going to France and I don't speak any French, I would at least learn a couple of phrases yeah. that could help me, like, I need help. Or where is the hotel? Where can I find a phone? Things like, like I would ask just basic questions. I would have those memorized. But also these people probably speak English and they aren't talking to her because they don't want the police around. So they just get to pretend that they don't know what she's saying. She's mocked and groped and knocked to the ground before Yvonne appears to help her up. The journalist takes Erica to a rooftop cafe where he tells her that Hamdi stole the statue from someone and was offering to sell it on the black market at the same time as he was going to sell information about where he got it to Yvonne. The people he stole it from are the ones who killed him to get it back, and now Yvonne knows, free of charge, who was after it. Yvonne claims that the reason Marcolus was there was to collect the stolen statue, and that Marcolus must have ordered his assassination when he refused to turn it over just as she was walking into the store. Yvonne urges her against contacting the police because the artifact smugglers will disappear as soon as cops are on the trail. Erica returns to her hotel, and as she tucks away her valuables in a dresser drawer, she notices a man behind her waiting in the room. Well, and and first of all, she's putting stuff in the most obvious places. I was like, right. I was like no one's going to look for my passport under these pieces of clothing. <laughs> yeah, in the top drawer of my dresser on the right she's, side. She spread them out slightly, like this one goes in this shirt, yeah. and this one goes in that shirt. <laughs> Suddenly the man speaks behind her. <gasps> Do you perform that little ritual everywhere you go, Dr. Barron? Or has something made you suspicious of our character as a people? Oh, you mean besides sneaking into my room? <laughs> uh, but I feel like even at home, let alone in a hotel, it's pretty common practice to tuck away your valuables in a drawer. If she needed a reason to be suspicious, though, she could point at Hassan here and say, You're in my room. Played by Frank Langella. Second build in the film and showing up here 30 minutes into the story. To be fair, we really didn't need 30 minutes before this point. No, for sure. He invites her on a walk, and she joins him after he threatens to involve the police. They head to his office in the same building. He finally introduces himself properly, Dr. Hassan, 
Director General for the Department of Antiquities of the Egyptian Arab Republic. He asks what her relationship is with Ivan, and she says that she trusts him, but she can't answer truthfully if he trusts her. When Ivan enters the office, Hassan excuses them both, but before they leave, he complains about their not having reported Hamdi's murder. Erica provides a vague description of the three men and a motive for the murder, the Seti I statue in Hamdi's shop. Hassan puts his second-in-command, Gamal, in charge of following her, since she's had eyes on the statue and they hope to locate it. I, I really liked the one of the exchanges in this scene, and when she says that you're the rudest, one of the rudest son of a bitches I've yeah. ever met, and then as Gamal is going out to follow her, he goes, Gamal, am I the rudest son of a bitch you've ever met? And he goes, yes, sir. He goes, <laughs> he goes all right, thank you, Gamal. Yeah, he like smiles about it. <laughs> Leaving her hotel the next morning, Erica is met by her guide for the day. She lets him know that she intends to visit Giza and then Zikara. He urges her to visit a museum instead of Zikara to stay out of the sun. Gamal is overdoing his private investigator shtick with a big hat and newspapers an inch in front of his face. Gamal, we got Gamal here. <laughs> nice <Nobody> hat. Cares. <laughs> what are you trying to be, a secret agent? When they pull up to the pyramids, Erica leans into the front seat to say, my God, they're big. And the driver and guide are able to mouth the words in sync with her because they're so used to hearing Americans say this. And also, she's an Egyptologist. She has to have some idea of yeah. how big the pyramids no, are. No, no, no. She's just another tourist. Yeah. I I have never seen them myself. And but... I won't say that when I see them. <laughs> yeah, because I know they're freaking huge. Yeah. <laughs> We get another one of those monument defacing scenes like in The Awakening last year Ugh, yeah. where a woman just climbs all over ancient Egyptian structures for photo ops. In the background here, we see the Sphinx, which is as relevant as the title will get over the course of the film. Mm -hmm. It won't make a reappearance and isn't important to the plot. Um, is she in these scenes pretending to be tourist-like? or I don't think so. Because yeah. I thought she was putting on a ruse because I figured she knew... She might be being followed, and so she was acting like a tourist. What would be the benefit of that? I don't know, but I got lost through a lot of these things, and so I think I was trying to read into the story more than that was actually there. I'm taking everything at face value now, because when we get to the end of the third act, I have no fucking idea what's going on. <laughs> okay, I was really looking forward to you explaining it to me. Well, uh, I, I, sorry. I... I can see both sides of that. I can I can see what you're saying that it certainly seems like she's like hamming it up. She does, right? But uh, I think she's also just genuinely like she's a dumb Egyptologist. Yeah, I I, I feel bad saying that she's a dumb Egyptologist, but, but she is. I mean, it's because there is somebody following her, and yeah. I and I wasn't super clear on why she was going here in the first place. I thought it was like she had arranged to meet the guy or like something. Like I thought that it was sort of like, okay, I'm going to throw them off my scent and just make it look like I'm doing touristy things. But, but to be fact, fair, she is an Egyptologist who decided to study this country and its ancient ruins for her career. And it's her first time in the country. So she's going to go to these things as a tourist either way. I guess. I, I just think that. You I mean, would, if I if I knew someone was following me, it doesn't benefit me to go to Giza any more than it would benefit me to go to the restaurant in my hotel every well, day. Well, I just thought it was throwing them off by thinking like, okay, she's innocuous. She's just doing touristy stuff. She's not doing anything in particular like trying to get this statue back. And so it would it would be like she's not worth following or, you know, she could lose them in the crowd. But at this point, if anyone is following her, she should know that they're either affiliated with Yvonne or with uh, Marcoulis. or well does Marcoulis know anything about her well he it, walked past her out of a shop right that's true but at least one of her men can identify that there was a woman there because he heard a scream well well yeah because like uh yeah that's what I would say but he didn't see her no he didn't see her but Marcoulis, you know if, if one of his men said uh I would gotten a scuffle and a woman screamed and he would he could I don't know he could right now the back. only people that could specifically know that she saw this statue are Hamdi, who is dead, Yvonne, who she told on of her own free will, and Hassan, who she also told. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so if anyone's following her, okay. then it's one of those two people, which she seems to believe right. both I, of. I'll, I'll, I'm with you. She's just being a dumb tourist. Got it. Erica moves inside with a tour group, and Gamal's driver asks if he's going to join his wife. Gamal says, oh, she's not my wife. I'm on a mission. 
And the driver says, well, you better follow her because I saw a girl lose her tail like this on an episode of Hawaii Five-0. So Gamal follows her inside the Serapeum, which is a necropolis about 12 miles south of Giza. The guide doesn't feel like going underground with her, so he just gives her a quick overview before they head inside. This is a burial chamber, but all the sarcophagi have been robbed, excepting Ramses I, and she corrects him. Ramses II, actually. Ramses I, Ramses II, it's picking nits. Selim, how exactly do you get to become a licensed guide? You buy a license. That's what I thought. The group heads underground, and they're being led by an obnoxious American man named Don, played by William Hootkins, and he keeps making bad puns and hitting on all the ladies. <laughs> hey, I hope we're going the right way, but if this guy's been smoking what I think he's been smoking in the water pipe, we're all going to end up in Pittsburgh. <laughs> and everybody laughs, as though it were funny. Gamal reluctantly follows her. The lights cut out momentarily, but Don gets a lamp running, and suddenly Gamal notices a gunman aiming for Erica. He tackles Erica to the ground as the man opens fire, and Gamal takes the bullet himself. We cut to, presumably hours later, where Erica waits in a holding cell. A guard digs through her purse and removes her passport. At first I thought he was taking the book. Yeah. I was like, oh crap. But it's they're both red, the passport and the book. When the guard is left alone with her, he throws her against the wall and begins to fondle her until suddenly Hassan appears and yanks the man off of her. Weirdly, Hassan has to button her shirt for her, like while they're standing next to each other. Yeah, it, it I mean. It's I, just a weird moment. Yeah, it's a very weird moment. I don't know how I feel about it. Like, I guess I can, I, I can feel like he's trying to, to, to help conceal her, like she might be too Nervous. Like she's paralyzed by what just happened. Yeah, but yeah. it just seems but like it feels a situation. Like a power play. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It, it seems like if if you like turn around and give her the privacy to button up her shirt or right. put your coat over her or something yeah. like that, but you don't have to delicately button each button of her shirt. It almost feels like, yeah, you deserve everything that's happening. Yeah, and to the you. way he talks to her after that isn't really fair either because he follows it up so that the guard gets thrown out of the cell and then she thanks him for saving her and he responds with are you still enthralled with our magnificent traditions? Like, what an idiot. Like, you still think Egypt's so great, you dumb rapey? And the last thing he said to her when she noticed him in her room was, why don't you trust us? And now he's saying, <laughs> you still think we're so great? And it's like, what? <laughs> Make up your mind, buddy. Which is it, Abe? Better keep your story straight. Hassan collects her things, and he walks out with them, so she has to follow him to get her stuff back. And they move to a hotel pool in the shadow of a big pyramid. Erica expresses a desire to head home, and Hazan returns her passport. That night in her hotel room, Erica finds the book that she promised to deliver to Hamdi's son, and a paper folded inside of it. It's a message in Egyptian. Suddenly someone is fiddling at her door with a key ring, and she hides under the bed. She watches footsteps move around her room until a bellhop leans down and finds her under the bed. He's delivering the developed photos that she left at a local pharmacy, and as a hilarious joke decided not to knock and just enter the room with the keys to scare the fuck out of her. Yeah. That's totally would never happen. Yeah. She makes the dumbest joke excuse possible for hiding under the bed. I was um just checking to make sure that the mattress tags hadn't been ripped off. Because it's against the law. Yes, monsieur. What are you, Fletch? <laughs> Just tell the guy you thought he was an intruder because he didn't knock or ask permission to enter. Well, and then I'm sitting here waiting for him to have been an intruder and just it was just like had an excuse. It's like, oh, yeah, no, no, I was just delivering these uh, mm -hmm. pictures you developed. But like, he nope. isn't. He's just a bad <laughs> hotel employee who goes into people's rooms without knocking. I feel like I was reading into everything that happened <laughs> in this movie and none of it, you know, panned out. <laughs> And I and I immediately recognize this actor as well. Who is this guy? Uh, uh, this is Kevork Malakian. Okay. Uh, I d don't know his name, but I am familiar with because he is another Indiana Jones. But his alum. Fez is familiar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, he is another Indiana Jones alum. Uh, also, uh, many other movies that uh, he appears in. But I immediately recognize him. It sounds like you could spell Kevorkian with the letters in his name, right? Kevorkian Malai. Well, I'm Ma Malik Malikian. Malikian. She asks him to translate the note that she found in this book, and it says, "It says uh, if you read this, they have found me. 
You must be careful. We were correct. It is much more than just a statue. She translates the cartouche from her photographs and tells Yvonne that the words claim that Seti resides under King Tut. Isn't it insanely dumb that Manefta would leave instructions on where to find King Tut anywhere? Yeah, since he was talking about the secret dying with him. Yeah. And then if, and then I, if I was this bellhop, I'd be like, uh, this note sounds like somebody died. Yeah. Um, but then, then she starts looking through some papers and then she writes down Manefta. Yeah. I was like. At the top of a sheet of paper, like, yeah. all right, just got to remember that name. Yeah. It's like, did you, did you decipher that from something or why did you write it down? I don't get it. They're making plans to head to Luxor together where Manefta did most of his work when they encounter Marcolis. Marcolis makes a run for it and Yvonne follows him. The gunman from the Serapeum follows the chase. Marcolis grabs Erica and gets a knife to her throat. I can barely hear what he says here, but I think he says, I know you saw the letter. I'm not quite sure what he says or which letter he would be referring to because he doesn't know about the book that Hamdi wanted delivered to his son. I know you saw the letter. No, I didn't. Stop lying. Mon Major got the word to me. Out of nowhere, a third guy, the gunman, is standing one foot away from them and slashes at Marcola's face with a knife before he runs off. Erica is furious to learn that Yvonne is a traitor and that it's he's giving information to Marcolis from her. I Is he? I mean, like, I don't know who these people work for. I yeah. get really confused. Marcolis works for himself. Okay, what is his end goal? Uh, he wants to, I mean, moving forward, he wants to interrupt the route. He wants to steal the, the treasures of Seti's tomb for himself. Okay, so he's just a treasure hunter. Like, I, I, I'm just confused. They all are. <laughs> Yeah. I don't know. I'm just confused as to everybody's motivation in this movie. Well, I um, I mean, if we're just going to get ahead a little bit ahead. It was my interpretation of Marquillas that, that he wanted to take over the route. Right. That's what I'm saying. The, 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 every, everyone is, is aware of this this secretive smuggling ring, the, the one that Kazan is supposedly trying to close up. Right. Uh, and so, uh, but apparently there's some kind of power vacuum or potential power struggle involving this statue which is part of a larger collection that's been discovered to start moving out. Yeah. Um, which, again, bothers me, that line of it's much more than just a statue. It's like, no, it ends up not being much more yeah. than just a statue. Well, I it think it's the only reason statue. it's more than just a statue is because of the information that they can glean from the cartouche and also from this, the papyrus later, but we'll get to that. Um, but yeah, what's, what's weird here is that Marcola says, I know you saw the letter. And I don't know what he means by letter unless that's not what he said. And if it's not what he said, I don't know what he says because I don't have subtitles for this movie. The letter, is he talking about the letter? If he means the letter to Hamdi's son. Right. It, it doesn't know, reveal anything. It doesn't reveal anything and I don't know how he would know about that letter because Hamdi wrote it in front of her and gave it to just her and no one else has handled this book. Well, the only thing I could think of is that if there is footage lost... Uh, we saw we see a scene of Marcoulis, uh questioning, or no, or was it the other guy questioning the the hotel uh, staff about Erica coming and going? I don't remember. Uh, I, I, I have it written down. Hassan. Uh, so someone questions the hotel staff about Erica's coming and going from the hotel, and so it's possible that he questioned the bellhop, and he said, "Oh yeah, she had a letter for for me to read." But either way, he corners her in this area and the the gunman from underground slashes him in the face and he runs off so so far as we understand this gunman is we don't know who he is or who he's working for and i don't think we ever get a name for him uh no i i only know who he is based on the actor yeah uh playing him um and uh but she's mad because apparently yvonne told marcolis something that marcolis told her right so now she knows that if she only told Yvonne this information and somehow Marcolis got it, that that's the leak. Okay. And he admits that Yvonne told him. So now she knows that this guy's not completely on her side. She phones Hazan's office to announce that she is headed to Luxor. And she arrives at Abdul Hamdi and Son's antique shop and knocks on the door until his son Tafik answers. She gives him the book and admits to having read the private note inside and then blurts out all the secret info about the SETI statue and the hotel where he can find her, all within earshot of a kid who is clearly listening with an intent to report this information to someone. 
Hazan finds her in Luxor and joins her as a guide to the Valley of the Kings. He tells her that these tombs were his childhood playground. He tells her that he had a secret place there where it was just him, and whenever he ran away, his uncle knew just where to find him. They head to Tut's tomb, and Hazan flirts with her a bunch until she relents and agrees to go to dinner with him. He urges her to get on a plane tomorrow for her own safety, and he tells her about another young Egyptologist who came to the country last year and thought he was discovering all this information about this underground ring, and then he wound up dead. She only takes this as a rejection, as she walks down to the carriage waiting at the street and slaps the horse's ass to indicate to the driver that she won't be needing a ride. So at this point, I'm really questioning her motivations as well, because obviously somebody's out to kill her Mm -hmm. because they were shooting at her she wants to be the next howard carter that's all she wants i i guess i just don't understand why that drive is worth your life and why you would keep digging in here and be like yeah i think i'm gonna leave for a while maybe let this cool down but now part of it seems to be her relationship with hassan which right just barely started like yeah there's no indication of them first starting to uh be interested in each other romantically until this moment where right. they have dinner together and he's like, you should right. get out of here. Which I guess I was confused by that because I was like, he, he's offering, he's telling her to leave and she's not taking his advice. But like at this point, they're not seemingly flirtatious until that moment where she's like, get out of here, driver. I'm, I'm staying in the night. Yeah. And then we cut to basically like a couple hours later and she's coming out of Hassan's home in a robe that matches his robe. And they're just standing on the edge of the Nile, looking out over the Nile. Um, this, this, in between this is where the scene that I have written down, where the the lone gunman checks with the hotel to, and finds out that Erica has not returned yet. Yeah. Um, also, it, this guy's motives are unclear because he tries to kill her in a very, although it's very dark, right. it's still a very public place. There's a yep. lot of people around. But then when he's with her alone, he doesn't try to kill her. Right. But I don't even know for sure if he was trying to kill her or what yeah. he was trying to do. But he pointed a gun at her and he shot, yeah, and he shot Hassan's him. assistant. Hassan and Erica really don't have any chemistry. And I think it's because Frank Langella is not charismatic at all. He just comes across as like smarmy and yeah. angry and mean. And he's also like a foot taller than her. But he has terrible posture. So he's probably actually like a foot and a half taller than her. But he's constantly hunched over. And it's just... Uh, they're just a weird couple because it's like Jillian Anderson and Frankenstein. Well, and, and he's done nothing to woo her, in my opinion, at all. No, literally nothing except when he finally gave her a glass of wine and said, get out of the country. And then she was like, oh, this guy, <laughs> this guy likes me. The next day, Erica heads to meet with Sarwat Rahman, the foreman at the dig from the discovery of Tut's tomb. He has already passed away because that was a long time ago, but his widow is still around. While Erica speaks to the widow, we see Marcolis arrive in Luxor by plane. The widow tells Erica that Howard Carter was good to her husband, that he gifted them the shovel that they used to break into the tomb, and all the rights to a concession stand in the Valley of the Kings, which is weird that some, like, white English guy is in charge of who can set up a concession stand in the right. Valley of the Kings. Yeah. Like, fuck you, I'll set it up wherever I want. Well, I, I guess... Um I, I guess with the discovery, you know, he he would have some pull. Yeah. About like, but even that seems weird. It's like, hey, in exchange for us taking all of your treasure, mm-hmm. I want to make demands of your country. And they're yeah. like, all right, you're famous. <laughs> After Erica leaves, we see the widow take the shovel off the wall and twist off the handle to remove the papyrus which was rolled up inside. Why did she do this? Uh, why didn't she do this a long time ago? Is another yeah. question. Yeah. Um, but she takes it out and the paper's crumbling in her hands, but she takes it to the corner of the room to burn it. Erica returns just in time to stop her and Mrs. Rowan tries to bite Erica's hand to get her to let go. What causes Erica to return? She was suspicious of this lady. (laughs) Okay. There's a, there's other moments later on where it's like, what? There was no clue that led you to that. Turns out Rowan stole the scroll because he thought that it was a curse on the tomb and that the dig would be canceled if it were discovered and translated. But of course it wouldn't. Like, no. They just wanted gold. That's, so they would have just kept digging no matter what. Oh, it's a curse. Great. That means you guys are scared to touch it, and I get all the gold. Yeah. Also, what would make you think that stealing the curse 
from the tomb would stop it from being cursed? Well, I don't think that's it would what stop it is, the curse. That it's a curse on the papyrus. That's that's what he he said that it would have been a, a curse that someone left at the door to the chamber so that people would be warned away from going inside. But that's not what it says. Yeah. And he should have been able to read it or find someone who could read it if Erica can figure it out in her hotel room. <laughs> I don't understand. I, I really want Menefta's ultimate secret to not robbing the tomb was writing a sticky note and le- sliding yeah. it under the door. Yeah. <laughs> I was saying, like, please do not steal from this tomb. Yeah. Erica photographs the papyrus and tells Rowan to put it back where she got it from while she does research. And the woman, like, dutifully puts it back in the shovel yeah. and hangs it on her wall. It's like, what? Fuck you, lady. I'll set it on fire yeah, like I was going to do a second ago. And again, like, to your point, why didn't she do this? Why is she waiting till right now to do this? And if she thought it was a curse, like, what are you worried about now? Are they going to cancel the dig now? This happened 50, 60 years ago. Does It doesn't make any sense. Rowan tells Erica that she is like all the others who take from Egypt. And later, Erica is grabbed by the kid from outside Hamdi's shop. He brings a message from Tafik. She is to meet him alongside a nearby mosque. He will tell her where to find the statue, which is already weird, because Hamdi was killed and the statue was stolen, so Tafik has no idea where the statue is. And and why does she want the statue? She, like, she already has the pictures of it. She doesn't yeah, need the statue. There's nothing relevant to the statue. I mean, she, maybe she thinks that there is. It belongs but, in a museum. <laughs> yeah. But even if it was, does she think that it's left unguarded somewhere or that someone's going to give it to her for free? Because and, she doesn't have cash on hand to pay for this statue. And, and if she finds it, she can't move it. So the fact that she's getting instructions to come and find the statue in person alone yeah. is like just 10 giant red flags. It's like, no, don't do that. That is a trap. In her hotel room that night, she translates the text of the papyrus. It was written by Manefta himself, pointlessly sharing that he found a way to keep Seti's final resting place a secret. But it doesn't even say in this note where Seti's resting place is. It's literally just a note that says, oh God, I came up with a great idea. And then he snuck it into the chamber. And that's a whole big plot point of this movie is finding this papyrus that literally just says, I'm a smart. <laughs> I don't understand this whole papyrus thing. Like, what? I don't. I don't understand why they were hiding it. I guess they it, just needed clues, and they and they're like, "What's Egyptian papyrus?" Okay, so there's a papyrus in there. That's important. Um, Egypt. Let's make it in Egypt. Uh, Erica moves to collect her valuables from under her clothes on the dresser when something occurs to her. People hide things that they like under things under other things. And that's when she looks at the map of the pyramid with the one room in the middle and then there's a second room underneath it. And she goes, did anyone think to check the second room in the pyramid? I bet, I bet there's, there's another one underneath it. And there is. She looks at the map of Tut's tomb and points to the queen's chambers under Tut's tomb before calling Hazan to relay that she is meeting with Tafik tonight at a mosque. And he's going to give her the statue for free, probably. Well, and she doesn't even say that at the mosque. She just says she's meeting with, with Tafik. Right. So he, Kazan goes to Tafik's shop. Right. Which is Looking not where she it. is. Right. Yeah. She notices the gunman from the Serapeum in her lobby when she is suddenly grabbed by Ivan, who hopes for forgiveness for what he did in Cairo, which, if I understand correctly, was selling her out to the murderous Marcolis character, yeah. which yeah. she should be very angry about. But she tells him that she's in a good mood because she just figured out where the statue came from and how all of the treasure has been taken. She asks for help losing her tail in exchange for a big exclusive on her incredible find because she, for some reason, still thinks this guy's a reporter. At at this point, though, I feel that she is playing him. Poorly, then. Like, she's like, you're going to help me lose this guy that's following me because you're a reporter and you, you you specialize in helping me lose my tail yeah um but also again now i'm now i'm also concerned wait with is her motivation just to get famous i think so i think everyone here just wants treasure otherwise she would have flown home already if someone tried to kill me and i didn't have a good reason to stick around then i would leave and the only good reason is to be famous forever for discovering the seti tomb yeah, I guess. I don't understand what anybody wants in this movie, which probably means they all just want the treasure because that just doesn't seem worth it to me, which what why nobody's motivation makes sense. Yeah. But instead of excited by this news, uh, Yvonne just seems disappointed by her greed, and he tries to like, oh, well, you know, you just want gold, and that, sh- that you should be embarrassed that you want gold like the rest of us do. 
And she's not taking any of this bullshit and tells him to fuck right off with his shitty guilt trip that he wouldn't have used on a man. Like, he wouldn't, he wouldn't go to Howard Carter and be like, why are you digging in this pyramid? You probably just want to find the tomb of the ancient pharaohs and be famous forever. And it's like, fucking yeah, that's why I'm here. That's what my job is, is to find these things. Erica leads her tail out of the building, and then Yvonne yanks him off the street, where we see them wrestle over a knife for a moment, before cutting to Erica getting out of a taxi near the mosque where she was told to meet Hamdi. It's empty, and it seems closed for the night, but the lights are all still on, and none of the doors are closed. Suddenly, someone appears who promises to lead her to Tafik. At the same time, Hassan is trying to find Erica in Luxor, and kicks in the door to Tafik's shop, and finds him dead inside, with his hands nailed to a cabinet full of antiquities. At the same time, a man promises to lead Erica to the Serapeum, where she's going to meet with Hamdi. She is led to the top of some stairs, when suddenly her escort shoves her down these stone steps into a chamber, which he locks behind himself. She swings a flashlight around the room and discovers another corpse in here with her. Weirdly, the dead body is right next to a doorway blocked with loose rocks suggesting escape should not have been especially difficult. Yeah, um, and I am I was only assuming that this was the guy that Kazan was maybe talking about, the other guy who went missing. Oh, from last year? Yeah. yeah. Maybe, but it's weird because they they go to the trouble of showing you this person died in this corner of the chamber right next to a tunnel that they could easily have dug through to escape, mm-hmm. first of all. Second of all, I was like, okay, well, maybe he was dead already. No, he wasn't dead already because he has one of the rocks in his right. hand. Like he started to dig himself out and then just rolled over and died. So maybe he was shot once or something like that. But there should have been some explanation for why this person didn't dig their way out. But he didn't. And for some reason, she thinks she has to roll the body over. Like I thought she was going to like check the other side of it for clues yeah. or something. And she goes to roll the body over and just screams because she touched a dead body and then never goes back to the body again. But she digs all these rocks out, and then there's a perfectly useful hole to escape through. So she crawls through that, and her flashlight dies, so she's forced to make a torch. And uh, <laughs> Sorry, all this is so, like, I, it's like, I cannot wait to compare this to Raiders. Yeah. When, when, he's like, indeed, the torch is going out. And it's like, where are we going? Through that wall. Yeah. <laughs> well, so, so she, for some reason, she crawls through this tunnel backwards. Um, well, because I think because there's a drop. Yeah, I wouldn't want to go head first on that drop. I wouldn't go feet first to a drop if I didn't know how far down it went. Well, if you have to go through a hole and you don't know how far down it goes, which one are you choosing? I would put my head through first to see how far down it goes. I don't know that you can see in there. It's pitch black. Well, either way, it just seems weird to trust that they didn't make this deep enough to kill me. I mean, I feel like she knocked some stones down in there. She knows it's deep. What if the what if she went feet first and fell eleven stories to her death? And she's gonna die in that other room anyway. Unless they come back fifteen minutes later and we're like, we put you in a holding cell and you jumped off a cliff, you fucking idiot. <laughs> <laughs> well, what happened to this guy? We don't know. He was here when we found yeah. it. <laughs> oh my god, another mummy! <laughs> this guy Barry. This guy apparently walled himself in here because otherwise, yeah. why did Look, he escape? He still has a rock in his hand. He clearly did this himself. But yeah, she crawls backwards through this thing and she falls into the next chamber, uh, which luckily for her, it's only like eight feet that she drops. And she goes to light another torch and quickly realizes that the room is full of corpses and bats and that the the (laughs) torch that she lit was actually just a human foot. Was it a hand or a foot? I think it was an arm, but but also very reminiscent to Marion waking up in the room full of corpses Mm -hmm. when 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 they break through the wall. It's like there's so much of this movie that mirrors Indiana Jones later. Yeah, later this same year, she collapses in the fluttering flock of bats. Are they called flocks? I don't know. Swarms. Swarm of bats. That sounds more likely. I'm looking up. I'm looking up what a group of bats is called. A flutter. It's like they should switch bats and crows, but they don't. Horde. Horde of bats. Colony. Colony. She collapses in a fluttering colony of bats. Hassan arrives in the town where Erica was led to the widow's home. It can also be called a cauldron of bats. A cauldron? Yeah. I'm <laughs> definitely using that. Hold on. She collapses in a fluttering cauldron of bats. <laughs> a 
Hassan arrives in the town where Erica was led to the widow's home, and then we see Erica exiting a giant cave at night and sneaking her way all the way over to Tut's tomb, which is uh, not in a pyramid, right? It's like buried no. in a in yeah. a valley, right? And uh, and so she goes into this building after hours. A dog notices her and starts barking until a soldier shuts it up. And it sounds like the dog's name is Hitler. <laughs> I couldn't tell what the guy says, but it sounds like he's telling the Hitler dog to shut up. Hitler! Yalla! The soldier moves into the bathroom where Erica is hiding and checks every stall before he starts to pee, same as anybody would. While he pees, we see that Erica is hiding in a crawl space above the urinals. And while she tries to remain quiet, just by coincidence, she happens to find a trap door with her hands. Yeah. I was like, wait, I... I thought something was leading her to these places. Nothing is leading her here. So, okay, so this building that she went to, this is the concession stand. Yes. Yeah, okay. This Next like the, to the, Tut's tomb. Right. Yeah, the so visitor the, center. Yeah, the visitor yeah. center slash concession stand. So this is what that guy was given. But, like, so that's why she went there? What I want to know is, did Carter give him this concession stand because he knew Seti was there? And he didn't want somebody digging down there? Or because he wanted only Rowan to have it? Or, or does he... I'm assuming that if Howard Carter knew there was another burial chamber there, he would have wanted that fame and just dug it up himself. I, I, I think what's happening is that that Rowan found the papyrus, realized where the secondary tomb was. How did he figure that out? Because there's no clue to that in the papyrus. The, there, there is something about something below. No, that was, not, under, in, that was not in that. What? That that was that was on the cartouche. Was it on the cartouche? Yeah. Okay. Because well, I was gonna go really broad and say he specifically built his concession stand there because he knew he could dig there. I I do think find... that's true. Okay. I I believe that. Okay. But but the question is, how did Rowan figure that out? I don't know. Unless he figured it out from that statue. Where was that statue originally? In... I thought it was in the chamber. Yeah, that's think... what I thought. Yeah, me too. So you can't find it. So as, it's like it as useful as one of those maps that says you are here. <laughs> yeah. It's like, great. Thanks. I already knew that. <laughs> I know where I am. I need to know where I'm not. Yeah. But yeah. So I don't, I don't know. They, they never really explained how Rowan found this place. And you would think that the papyrus would spell it out. But all the papyrus says is, I found a great way to hide the chamber. I learned it from the stone cutter. Like, like the person who's reading the papyrus knows which stone cutter he's talking yeah. about thousands of years later. But uh, they don't really make it clear how he found this place. But Rowan talked to Carter and he said, hey, for no reason, I want uh, a concession stand right here. Mm -hmm. Can you get me the rights to this square block of uh, neighborhood? And he was like, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll just phone up the, the president of Egypt or whoever and we'll set that up. And so he's been here and he built this thing. But as far as she knows, Seti is under Tut because that was explained on the cartouche. And she knows that Rowan had this concession stand. Mm -hmm. But I don't know how she figured out, oh, climb into a crawl space above the urinals in the bathroom and find a trap door that leads to this whole thing. So I think that part of that is, which she explains later, is that she, I think, put two and two together when, what's his name? Har Hamdi? Uh, ha Hamdi, no, the the Franklin Jello guy. Hassan. Hassan. When Hassan was saying that he had his own place to to be as a child, like this this little crawl space thing is kind of like a kid's hiding place. Yeah. So maybe that's where she was like, Okay, this is where kids hide and she just randomly found this thing that was a you know, a tunnel to the chamber. Maybe it's something to do with that. And I, I know she was also tipped off by the fact that mrs rowan had so many nice things that she mm -hmm. was like oh well you clearly have like someone supporting you with money somehow and so she thinks that this woman's skimming off of what they smuggle out of the burial chamber uh she also finds while in the crawl space uh a couple of un uh, used cans not unused but used slightly burned candles right so i guess she was thinking like well why would someone have so many candles in here but she doesn't have... But it's a bathroom. Yeah, it's a bathroom. Yeah. I fully expect there probably to be used <laughs> candles tossed away. Yeah. Why are there all these urinal cakes up here? Must be treasure. 
<laughs> must be treasure nearby. <laughs> My nose smells something, and it smells like treasure. There's gold near here. <laughs> yes. Um, but I don't know how she has confirmed for herself that the Rowan family is involved in this smuggling ring. And, and also how, <laughs> how they got the statue out of this trap door. Yeah. In and out. Yeah, well, it doesn't really make a lot like, of sense. Yeah, there must be another way in and out of this place because this is not any way that you could smuggle large items out of this. Right? Thing. She lowers herself into this chamber and she walks through this roughly hewn corridor. At the end of a hall, she finds a switch for lights and then she finds herself in the middle of Seti's tomb. All the artifacts are here and she's giddy with excitement. Apparently, the recreations of these tombs took six months to put together. It looks so great. The the Tut tomb and yeah. this tomb together. I felt the Tut tomb felt fairly realistic to me. This doesn't yeah, feel Yeah, I like... almost thought do they shoot this at the yeah. at the actual Tut like But this one doesn't feel like an actual Egyptian tomb at all because it is enormous, which yeah. is not how those chambers are. Right, but they did make the point earlier when they were on their um when when Hassan was giving her a tour and he said, "Yeah, I I'm sure you noticed that they're they're like vaulted ceilings in this yeah. tomb, which is not normal. So he was saying that that's that's what made Seti's tomb so wonderful is that it was it was literally built extravagantly tall compared to a normal mm. tomb because his was better than Tut's. But I also think it's believable in the sense for me, like I it's like if if this had been like a national treasure esque sized like burial chamber with this massive massive opening, I was like no, this is. A fairly large room. It, it reminds me a lot of the MacGyver episode with uh, Alexander the Great. Osiris. Yeah, that, that's that's what this kind of was like. It's like, yeah, this is kind of a believable room. Yeah, it's big, but not too big. Yeah, not and impossibly it, big. And it's completely packed full of stuff, and 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 not like in a decorative way. It's just like stuff is crammed in there, and it's like, yeah, I kind of feel like this is how it would look. Yeah, Erica returns to her hotel room somehow. And once again, encounters Marcolis and makes a run for it. He chases her into the lobby until he is stopped by the gunman and Yvonne. This is where she finally realizes that Yvonne is not on her side. Marcolis informs Erica that Yvonne is the one paying the gunman to follow her around. Yvonne demands the location of the statue from Marcolis. If I knew where the statue was, why would I be following her? Because she saw your men kill Hamdi. You think they were my men? <laughs> Then you're a fool, Major. So right here, we just found out that Yvonne thinks that Marcolis took the statue, and Marcolis thought that Yvonne took the statue. So there's a third party of bad guys. Yeah, yeah. I don't involved. know. I don't know who took anything. I don't. I don't know who knows what. I am so confused at this point. Well, there's two possibilities in in my mind, which is. I don't know which of these people Rowan's family is involved with if if yeah. he's involved with either one of them. I don't think he is. I, I don't think – I think Rowan's family has teamed up with the third party. Well, we and know – both of these well, guys want to we're going to find out who the third party is here in a moment. Right. But, for, but at this moment in the story, we know that both of these guys want to take over the smuggling route. Correct. That Rowan's people currently hold. So unless there's four teams of bad guys – Rowan's family is teamed up with the third party that we that we haven't figured out yet. Marcolis points Yvonne at Erica and tells him to ask her what she knows since she's been missing all night and she's dirty from exploring some cave somewhere. Yvonne drags her into an adjoining room and he asks her when she lies that she met with Tafik and asked him a few questions but got nowhere. Yvonne admits here that he had Tafik killed and then a gunshot rings out from the other room. Yvonne runs to see what happened and looks over the balcony to see Marcolis dead on the ground and the gunman claims he was trying to escape. I'm, n I'm not getting a good sense of how high up on this building they were. Yeah. Did did John Rice davis just dive off of the balcony of the third floor and die? Well, they must have both jumped off. Yeah, because the bad guy's down there too. Yeah, how did he get down there? But either way, uh, Marcolis is dead. Erica flees the building and jumps into a horse-drawn carriage by the curb. As the driver offers her a continually decreasing price, she gets out and steals a truck with 20 guys standing in the bed. She slams on the gas, drawing attention to herself as a bunch of passengers fall out of the back, and Yvonne and the gunman give chase. One of the men in the truck bed reaches in the driver's side window to stop her, and she uses the widow's trick of biting his arm. <laughs> 
Suddenly, there's a crate truck loading in the middle of the street, and Erica waits until the last second to steer around it, but the men chasing her have ample time to do the same and apparently chose to crash into the truck. <laughs> Next, they intentionally crash into the side of Erica's truck, and then they crash a third time into the side of a previously uninvolved vehicle. It's probably the worst choreographed car accident that I've ever seen because they, there's too much time for everyone to avoid crashing, and they yeah. do it anyway. And they're all going so slow. <laughs> Unless the twist is that Yvonne is trying not to follow her. Another car that he hits crashes into a building, and when the driver gets out, a homeowner dumps water off of the roof onto the driver's head. I'm not clear if this is a regular practice in Egypt that you just climb up on the roof and dump water Are off you of sure your building. It's water? Yeah, uh, it was... might be a chamber pot. Well, he stands there for like six seconds of her dumping it on his head instead of immediately freaking out. This is what you do, like in Doctor Fu Manchu, when he just stands there getting hit by the sprinkler for a while. <laughs> yeah, but the sprinklers aren't <laughs> shooting piss all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it was just cold out and the guy was like oh, that's better anyway <laughs> instantly made it worse <laughs> Yvonne pulls up alongside Erica's vehicle as his assistant shoots out the tires and then Erica shoves their car off the side of the road before plowing straight through a wall on purpose again <laughs> because she's looking straight out the windshield and then at the last second she goes oh no <laughs> and then crashes just full speed through a wall she rushes into Hazan's office and tells him things that I hadn't figured out yet. Firstly, that she knows exactly where Seti's tomb is and that Rowan's family has been looting it for years. And it's like, how do you know that? <laughs> like, she has nice stuff in her house, but she explained that by saying that Howard Carter took good care of their family over right. the years. So you could assume that that's where all of their their riches came from. You didn't have to explain that. You could have pretended like Howard Carter didn't take care of the family really well. His immediate response is, Ramon's family, they've been looting it for years. How did you get out? Look, just call the police. They're going to be here any minute. Who's going to be here? Ivana. What do you mean, how did I get out? She realizes here that he hasn't made a move to call the police, and Hassan's uncle appears, the one who locked her in the underground chamber. The uncle points a gun at her, and Hassan gets in the way. Suddenly, the gunman and Ivan are popping up in the windows and shooting into the house, and the uncle is returning fire. Then Hassan is returning fire, and he shoots through a window, breaking the glass, but it's, like, embarrassingly out of sync with the gunshot. <laughs> like, it, yeah. it's almost a second later the window tips. Also, it's one of those shootouts where anything that's made of glass is getting shot and no one else is getting shot. Right. So now we have one Egyptologist who trusts everyone, four men who have tried to betray her multiple times, and she's still taking orders from Hassan, who tells her which way to escape this shootout. The uncle tries to shoot at Erica while she's climbing over a wall, and Hassan is forced to kill his own uncle. Hassan then kills Ivan while he stands at the edge of a dock. Now this this part is so confusing. She climbs over a wall to get away from where all these people are shooting at each right. other. And she seems to be going toward Ivan, mm -hmm. who is standing at the end of a dock next to a boat. Hassan sees this happening, and he shoots Ivan, and Ivan dies on the dock, and then... Hassan walks out onto the edge of the pier. Mm -hmm. He gets into the boat <laughs> and he just sails off. He drives away into the, the middle of the lake. And Erica's standing on the shore, like, Where, what are, where are you going? Why did, why am I alone? And then we just cut to 12 hours later. Like, should I understand the, the motive for that? I don't, I don't know why he left. I don't, I don't know anything. I'm so lost at this point. All of the bad guys have been shot dead except for the good guy who knew that his uncle locked her underground and left her to die. We cut to the next day, Erica rides a horse to the Valley of the Kings, and she finds Hassan in Seti's tomb. She demands that they run away together because she's in love with this murderous schlub, but here she notices that he was shot in the attack yesterday. She won't leave his side because she's completely in love with him for no apparent reason. She tries to walk him out of the tomb, and he makes her scout ahead for a moment, but when she comes back, she finds him destroying the threshold with a sledgehammer and crushing himself with rocks in the process. Yeah, that door just comes right... I thought he was going to stand on the other side of the door and let it come down. I think that was his plan, and he <laughs> fucked up. Like, he just I don't know. timed it wrong. I don't think you want to close yourself in there and die of, like, starvation. I think he wanted to be like a pharaoh buried in the tomb with all these treasures. I don't know. I feel like I'd choose the door... I'd, well, I, I'd, I'd rather get smushed right away than, than die of starving in a tomb. I don't know. Maybe. 
I mean, presumably SETI is still in here, right? Yeah, and so you got mummy jerky at least for a while. <laughs> Delicious. Um, and and this, I mean, I know we're not quite at the end, but this is always one of the things that bothers me. Like as far as archaeological finds that are still relatively easy to access, right? And uh, because the whole cave collapses, and it's really kind of frightening. Yeah, like her 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 escape through these tunnels with stuff falling on yeah, her, and she's yeah. just being the whole cavern is filled with sand dust. And it's like, like the last ten minutes of almost every mummy movie is yeah. the collapse of the of the entire yeah, structure. But this is the first time I actually felt like, oh man, this actor is in danger because mm. like there's so much dust in the air. Like in in the Brendan Fraser mummy, things are collapsing, but it's just it's so it's so cleanly filling. Yeah. And this is just like explosions of, of small particles in, in the air. And it's like, oh, man. And she's getting clobbered by rocks on the way out. Yeah. Um, and she's just having a panic attack in the hallway, too, because stuff's falling behind her and in front of her. Yeah, yeah. So she's like, what do I do now? But she manages to get herself out. And uh, and her boyfriend, Hassan, is buried in this chamber forever. So I, does that mean he gets all that stuff in the afterlife, too? Because that's the point, right? <laughs> <laughs> like do, is he Fighters also keepers. rich or does he show up and he's like hey seti guess what i get half of your shit now <laughs> because i died in the same room when he wasn't mummified oh is that the rule i, I don't know the rules she escapes the chamber and mourns the death of the man who consented to her murder yesterday she sits on the steps outside tut's tomb and a tourist asks if she's been digging or found anything nothing to write home about we get one last glimpse of the treasures of Seti buried with Hassan, and it fades to black. That's the end of our film. Yeah. So it really bothers me in movies where you have this great archaeological find, and there's a cave-in. Granted, yep. a, a, a pretty, pretty substantial yeah. cave-in, but it was dug once. It can be dug again. Well, that's that was going to be exactly my question when we got to the end here. Like, isn't she just going to go tell someone and be like, I found Seti's tomb. It's right there. Yeah. yeah, she totally would. I, but this is what happened in uh, the Legend of the Holy Rose in <laughs> the MacGyver episode, yeah. where it's like, "Oh, we found uh, we found all this like famous biblical artifacts, and uh, they're in this room. Oh, but it kind of partially collapsed on the top part. It's yeah, like, let's never go back. <laughs> let's never try to uncover this room ever again. It, it's it's like the the you know the Goonies with the pirate ship sailing off. It's like okay, well get out there in a boat yeah. <laughs> and go grab that ship. Yeah, there's so much freaking gold. Or it's going to sink eventually because there's no way that ship is going to sail forever. And right. when it goes down, you get you get your ass out there. Yeah. Um, also, all those caves are filled with stuff. Like, and most of it was booby traps, but it was all made from old pirate stuff. That's going to be, like, worth a major amount of money. Anyway, I'm I also get the, goodies, but. the implication seems to be from the final shot that the chamber was undisturbed. Correct. Like, yeah. somehow the door yeah. collapsed shut yeah. and all, everything else broke apart, but the room is fine. But, like, I don't understand. Does she have some sort of reference for, like, their keeping it secret now? Like, it, it, it didn't feel like we were convincing her that this was something... That she wanted to now preserve. Right. I, yeah. I honestly think the, the point of the film is that all of these thieves and murderers who've been telling her the whole time, don't be greedy, that message actually sunk in. And she's like, they're right. All those crazy murderer types were right. I should be less greedy. I'll leave all this stuff where it is, even though there's nobody left to control it because literally only, only Hassan and his uncle knew about this place. I, I, I felt like we were going we were again i was trying to read too much into this i thought we were going to be unraveling some sort of secret where they left a trail of people trying to protect the tomb yeah because like like the the mummy right exactly just like the mummy because at the beginning he's like well if it's unguarded we're not we're we're gonna rob it so i'm like oh so there's been some lineage of guards like in the mummy and then she's gonna fall in love with one or she's gonna meet one and respect him and then she's gonna continue the the preservation of seti's tomb but that's not what actually happened. yeah she doesn't like put on war paint and then stand outside the concession stand with a spear at the end of the movie <laughs> which would have implied that but here's my other question is that if these people are like evil and they're just taking stuff out of the tomb to pay for their own lifestyles why does the tomb still seem full if like 50 years later you haven't sold enough stuff there's that much stuff in there i guess 
It's just uh, I think it, it would have made more sense if it were clear that something has been taken from this room other than the one statue that they immediately stole back. Yeah. And also, we never figure out who leaked that statue. Like, yeah, how did it get out? Where did Hamdi get this statue? And how did he... Like, they clearly took it back from him and put it back where it was. But for some reason, Hamdi is the only person who figured out this other place. I, I'm, I'm assuming it was a hole in the organization that was plugged, but stuff got out. And that's what Frank Is this Langell, an organization? I, I think I think. Are there more people? I, I think that when Marcoulis tells Yvonne that he's trying to take over the route, in, quote, in quotation marks, that everyone is aware that there is a smuggling ring right and and no one knows quite who it is or where it is or, or what the head of it is yeah um but Marcula seems to think that yvonne is trying to make a power move to take it and perhaps Marcoulis was part of it or w- worked with the people who were involved with it um because he seemed to want that statue but i don't know if maybe he was working as an agent of Hassan like in the sense of like hey if you find this statue we'll cut you in or but, but that's to imply that there's more people out there that yeah, know exactly. all this stuff so but I, I think the implication of the story is that only two people actually know the location of the tomb okay. and that the two of them the uncle and Hassan we'll take were individual taking items things out. out one at a time and finding people to fence them okay but, but we don't know how the statue got out. Right. <laughs> I mean, there must be some, like, there was a bunch of tunnels down there. There's there's some other way to get into it. Yeah. It probably yeah. leads into, like, a shed somewhere that just says electrical on the side. Because they know no one's going to look there. <laughs> That's where the septic tank is. Don't go in there. Yeah, it's it's where the, the alien from Without Warning keeps all of his bodies. Our director here was Franklin J. Schaffner. He directed Planet of the Apes. Patton, Papillon, Boys from Brazil, all four of which were scored by Jerry Goldsmith, as we mentioned in our Casablanca review. I mean, Cabo Blanco, same thing. Writer John Byram wrote and directed Heartbeat for us last year, and he comes back to write and direct Razor's Edge for us in 1984. Novelist Robin Cook also wrote the novel that was previously adapted into Coma, which I said before. Uh, Coma was adapted into a screenplay and directed by Michael Crichton, which is interesting because usually uh, he's adapting his own work right, or someone right. else is adapting his work. It's not usually Michael Crichton adapting a different novelist. It seems like Coma did okay in the box office, and as a result, the Sphinx novel was a bestseller before it was even released. And greenlighting the adaptation was a no-brainer because no one had even read the book yet. The music here was from Michael J. Lewis. He scored North Sea Hijack, a.k.a. Folks, for us last year. Cinematographer Claude Renoir is not a renaissance era painter (laughs) uh he is credited dp on barbarella and the spy who loved me he had barely started production when he suffered some sort of eye injury and was replaced with the credited dp ernest day as a result this is claude renard's last dp credit editor michael f anderson we just discussed his work three episodes back as the editor of cabo blanco the other editor robert swink did Papillon, Rooster Cogburn, Boys from Brazil, and Going in Style. Leslie Ann Down was Erica Barron. We just had her as Jillian Bromley in Rough Cut last year, opposite Burt Reynolds. She's probably best known for her hundreds of appearances each on soap operas Sunset Beach and Bold and the Beautiful. She was also Georgina Worsley on the British series Upstairs Downstairs. She married assistant director Enrique Gabriel during the production. Frank Langella played Ahmed Hazan. He got an Oscar nomination for playing Nixon in Frost Nixon. He was Skeletor in Masters of the Universe. We saw him last year in Those Lips, Those Eyes. And just before that, he was the title character of John Badham's Dracula in 79. John Gilgood was Abdu Hamdi. We saw him last year in Caligula, Elephant Man, and The Formula. This year he'll show up in Lion of the Desert, Chariots of Fire, and Arthur after this. Vic Tablian played Khalifa. Maybe that's the gunman? That's the gunman, yeah. Again, only I only know that that's him because it's like, oh, well, I recognize this, this right. guy. Uh, he'll be back later this year as Baranka, a.k.a. the Monkey Man in Raiders. Uh, Martin Benson played Muhammad. He's Father Spoleto in The Omen and Solo in Goldfinger. He'll be back later this year as Mr. Montero in The Sea Wolves. John Rice davies was Stefanos Marcolis. He's Gimli. He's Sala. 
He's Professor Maximilian Arturo. You know him. Yeah, he is. Sliders. Yeah. yeah. That's Maximilian Arturo. I know. William Hootkins played Don. We had him last year as Colonel Taylor in Bad Timing and Munson, Dr. Zarkov's assistant in Flash Gordon. Get your toothbrush or whatever. Later this year, we'll have him talking about Top Man in Raiders of the Lost Ark. There's a lot of Raiders people in here. Yeah. Um, can we verify something on Vic to uh, to, to Balin? Yep. Um, because the IMDb photo is of him, isn't of the monkey man. It's of... It's, it's, a, it's There's a slash, like he plays two characters. He does play two characters. Yeah. Okay. Just checking. Yeah. Who is the other character that he plays? Um, the guy who, um, with... Uh, Dr. O- Doc Octopus. Uh, the, he, India has two guys. At the guys beginning when, yeah. they're, when they're finding the, the cave? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that makes why sense. Why can't I remember Dr. Octopus's that's, name? Well, that, that character's name is Baranka. That's why it says Baranka yeah, yeah, yeah. slash Monkey Man because he shows up later in the movie. Or, I'm not sure that it's not the same guy. He might be. He might have been the guy who led Indiana Jones to that cave and also was mm-hmm. uh, with the monkey later. Those are all the credits I had for this one. Well, I, I covered uh, Kavork Malachian, uh, who is uh, the uh, brother of the cruciform sword right. in Last Crusade, who yeah. is uh, the, I guess, ally of Indy overall. Um, he like he, he certainly wasn't an enemy. He was an enemy at first, but realized. Um, uh, I also like him in the remake of the Flight of the Phoenix movie. Oh, which, okay. Which with Giovanni Ribisi and yeah, 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 Dennis Quaid. It's not a great. It was a we- it's a weird movie to remake in modern times because you don't it, it'd be like home it'd be making Home Alone now with cell phones. It's like it doesn't make the plot doesn't work yeah. unless it's in that time. Uh, I didn't realize it was present day on the remake. I didn't see. Yeah, yeah, it's an old plane, but it's still like the it's still like relatively modern. Does that mean it's time for a Last Flight of Noah's Ark remake? Uh, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> we're good yeah we're, we're fine like, on that oh wait there's 130 year old japanese guys here who don't know that world war ii ended <laughs> how is that possible um oh and the sorry uh the uh i'm gonna again i'm bad with names here i'm gonna say two frank ta- langola <laughs> L- M- langolier um uh tute lemkow uh who played tafik Oh, okay. He plays the old man who John Rice Davies and Indiana Jones go to see about the uh, medallion, translating the medallion. So they must have just been hanging out in Egypt. Right. And they were like shooting raiders and they were like, hey, is there any other films that are shooting in town that we <laughs> yeah. could audition for while we're down? Um, uh, my last note is for the uh, Lady Carm. Carmarvin, Carmarvin, Lady Carnarvon? Carnarvon? yeah, yeah. Um, because this, I was like, oh, that's Victoria Tennant. Yeah. Um, you know, she's in All of Me and L.A. Story. Yeah. Um, and I don't, and I was, I was like, oh, I hope, I hope we get to see more of her. <laughs> yeah. And no. nope, she's just in the one scene. Um, yeah, this movie, I was very excited. I think twenty minutes in, and I texted both of you guys, like, holy crap, this is exactly what we thought it was going to be, and then from there, it just fell apart. <laughs> uh, I actually really enjoyed this movie overall. Um, I think by the end, I, I did. didn't like it. I didn't like it pretty much the whole time. Like, I love the I love movies like this, but this movie was baffling. Like, none of it made sense to me the entire way. I kept thinking, okay, I'm piecing this together, and then I just never did. And it, it just, I don't. It wasn't a good story. I definitely got the impression that the book was probably written quickly because he had to strike while the iron was hot and that they they weren't concerned with it making as much sense as long as they got to an ending that seemed satisfying and it didn't matter if you could keep track of all the players. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but because so many of the villains of this story are completely interchangeable, they're all just angry Egyptian guys who want to be in control of treasure from this one room and that's literally the backstory for all three of the people that she's fighting with the entire time then it's just like what what, how are these people any different from each other i i liked that this movie was a female-led movie uh because i think that it's interesting to to have this like uh, 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 this female egyptologist 
but it's really upsetting that she doesn't know anything about Egypt as a country. Yeah, she has a doctorate in Egyptology. Yeah, uh, she reminds me a bit of Denholm Elliott's character in uh, in Last Crusade when he's in Iskandron and he's like, does anyone here speak English or even ancient Greek? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, it's like that's all he's got. <laughs> it's perfect. Uh, uh, but... Uh, um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I had an, I had an okay time watching this movie. Yeah. I, I think it's, it's, it's a fun watch if you turn off your brain and you're just like, all right, this is fun. Like whatever. I'll watch these people fight. But if you're trying to pay attention to the story, it's very cluttered. It, it doesn't plot points don't logically follow from each other. And it's, it's not as nice a system where this clue leads to this room yeah. which leads to this clue which leads to this I room know. i'm which pretty is... good at turning off my brain at, at when movies when i'm just like well this is really fun but it wasn't like even if you ignore all the plot holes in the There's story a lot of talking it's long and it's not very action filled like it's just I, I don't know it doesn't have a lot going for it plus it's got a bunch of weird story issues I got the impression with that car chase scene that they were very limited in what they could do yeah because they were shooting in egypt and they were like, okay, well, these people are letting us use their cars, but we can't wreck them. So let's just drive like five miles an hour and crash into each other. But we can totally climb all over these ancient monuments. Yeah, that's fine. Or I'll dance around on the Sphinx like an idiot. <laughs> or we're going to have her climb up on the Sphinx, get the shot really quick because they're going to yell at us. Yeah, exactly. I, I was surprised we didn't see her like just climbing one of the pyramids at one point. But yeah, no, um, I would say for me, this is probably a thumbs down. Oh, it's definitely a thumbs down for me. It's going to be a thumbs up for me. Right. I like to be contrary to you guys. Although I am going to change. <laughs> Say, I bet you it's still in the same part of our list. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, I'm, I am going to bump it down based on some things that we were talking about. Yeah. I did have it in my number three spot. Whoa. Holy I, shit, Harley. Richard. Yeah. Because I, I, uh, for me, everything below that is just like, blah. All right. It, it, it's a real steady, but I would watch this again. If anything, I would watch this again just because of all the Raiders stuff that has nothing to do with Raiders because it was before Raiders. Yeah, I would watch I this know. again if I could find like a Blu-ray of it, but I'm not going to watch it again otherwise. The one that we watched was the one off of archive.org, which was a very, <laughs> very low resolution version of the movie to the point that when she hands the letter to the bellhop, I didn't know that she was asking him to translate it for her because I couldn't even see what the letters were on it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so I, I, I bump this down. It's now in my number four spot. All right, Jess, uh, where's this going on your so, list? But, oh, sorry. Yeah, what's it above? So it's now in my number four spot, which puts it uh, below Fear No Evil, but above Windwalker. Okay. All right. I got it in number eight out of 13 for the year. Uh, it's below Cabo Blanco and above Fort Apache the Bronx. I have it in 10th. Uh, it's just under Blood Beach. And just above Earthbound. Because I didn't really care for the movie. And I thought it was very sloppily made. Well, it's going to move down on my list. Like, things are going to go above it. Right away. Yeah, we've had a lot of stinkers up front. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll fix that. I think that's everything for Sphinx. If you guys have any thoughts you'd like to share with us, we are Vintage Video Pod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Letterboxd. Where, as I've said before, you can find each of our full movie rankings for the year. We can also be found at VintageVideoPodcast.com. We also have a Discord now. You can find a button at the top of our .com and join the 24-7 movie chat and share your thoughts on episodes past, present, and future. Also, search for Vintage Video Podcast on YouTube and subscribe to our channel there. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time when we'll be discussing American Pop, which IMDb describes like so. The story of four generations of a Russian-Jewish immigrant family of musicians whose careers parallel the history of American popular music in the 20th century. Mm-hmm.